everyone's having a great time so far today. Before we jump into our next panel, please enjoy this commercial brought to you by Zenus AI, a leader in the ethical facial analysis space. Zenus brings the power of AI to every camera to help companies collect consumer insights in any physical space without collecting personal data. With our cutting edge technology, brands understand and optimize the customer experience in any physical space. If you believe that AI will shape the future, join the revolution. All right, it's my pleasure to introduce our next session, a panel titled, Where AI is Delivering Value and Where It Isn't. On this panel, we have Dan Jeffries, Chief Technology Evangelist at Pachyderm, Amin Kazaruni, Chief Analytics Officer at Orange Theory Fitness, Melissa Schusterman, Head of Customer and Product Analytics at Rite Aid, and Blake Hunter, Senior Director of Data Science at Drinks. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Hello, AI4 audience, and welcome panelists. How's everyone, go How's everyone doing? Great. Good. Great. It's great to be here. All right. Well, we're excited to kick this off. So without any further ado, let's jump into our first question for today. Uh, and Amin, because you and I are friends, I'll pick on you just a little bit. Please introduce yourself and your role so that the audience can get to know you a little better. Hey, my name is Amin Kazruni. I'm the Chief Data and Analytics Officer at Orange Theory Fitness. For those of you who don't know, Orange Theory Fitness is a franchise concept, um, technology track, coach inspired, uh, science backed one hour fitness experience, about 1,500 locations globally. Uh, my job spans analytics around the exercise physiology space, heart rate phase space, uh, telemetry off of fitness equipment, and your more traditional performance marketing, website, mobile app optimization as well. Excited to be here. Thank you. We're excited to have you here as well, Amin. Daniel, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm uh, Daniel Jeffries. I am the Chief Technical Evangelist at Pachyderm, which is the Swiss Army knife of data for data engineers, anybody doing all kinds of data transformations and uh, totally language agnostic, getting stuff ready for the data scientists to do their fantastic job. And I'm also the Managing Director of the AI Infrastructure Alliance, a nonprofit that has uh, 30 plus vendors and platforms all uh, working together, getting out of their silos, getting their engineers talking and uh, working on the standards for the industry. Excellent. Melissa, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Melissa Schusterman. I head up customer and product analytics at Rite Aid. Um, Rite Aid could not be more different than um, the prior two speakers. Uh, we are not brand new. We are not cutting edge. We are an old school pharmacy which over the last couple of years with COVID has transformed into an omni-channel organization. Um, I come to Rite Aid from Comcast and from Vanguard. Um, and I think that my, um, uh, my basic nature is as a marketing analyst. Um, I love telling stories from data. I love seeing the stories in the data. Um, and the stories at Rite Aid are really interesting because we have both your, um, you know, milk and eggs and um, uh, drinks purchases, but we also have your ongoing uh, um, prescription purchases. So you mix up, um, you know, retail and subscription, and you get some really interesting puzzles. Um, but looking forward to how my, um, I think, better tooled peers work with AI. Well, we will talk all about that. Blake, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. My name is Blake Hunter. I'm a senior data I'm a senior director of data science at Drinks. Uh, Drinks is a technology company that's enabling other companies to be um, online to sell wine online. Um, before joining Drinks, I was at Activision, leading teams of data scientists um, in Microsoft, um, and also through academic research projects. Um, been constantly working with data. Um, at Drinks, we're currently 
working on projects ranging from recommendation systems to building out uh, AI driven features to um, things from computer vision to natural language processing. So we're really running the gambit of, of data at Trinx. Excellent. Thank you all so much uh, for the introductions. Patrika, why don't we jump into question number two, which is about use cases. <clears throat> Okay, and Daniel, I was thinking you could kick us off here if you don't mind. The question is all about AI use cases, and I know you're all seeing it up on your screen, but basically AI use cases span pricing, inventory management, demand forecasting, conversational AI, rec systems, personalization, robotics, and more. So in your mind, what are some of the most exciting innovations going on in the AI for retail space? And again, this is coming to Dan if you wouldn't mind kicking us off. Yeah, no worries. Look, I think um, I think Melissa said it best that sometimes the most boring cases are actually the most interesting. And that's primarily because when I think about artificial intelligence, machine learning, it's trickling out of academia and it's trickling out of the FANG companies and the giant tech companies down to kind of the rest of us and the, and the rest of the enterprises. And a lot of those initial use cases are very structured data, right? And that's you don't always see, there's kind of an inverse proportion of the number of employees doing really innovative stuff, right? To like 10 to 20 people working on the, you know, cutting edge object detection and the kind of stuff Andrew Ng's working on and all, all that wonderful stuff. Not totally true across the board, but I mean, really just the demand forecasting, you're getting a sense of, you know, the customer, you're getting a sense of, of churn prediction, all these kinds of things are tremendously important not to be overlooked um, just for the sexier use cases, although the sexier use cases are are fantastic, a team should take a crawl, walk, run approach to doing those, though. Definitely. Thank you so much. Anyone else want to just jump in here? Agree, disagree on boring but effective being maybe the best? <laughs> well, having said boring but effective, I will say there's a place where I think AI is really critical in retail. Um, our pricing and our um, our merchandising strategy is way too complex to be thought of slowly and methodically by individuals. And I'm going to give you an example. Um, we have um, products that we sell online through e-commerce, and we have products that we sell in the store. And we know what our inventory is online, and we know what our inventory is in the store. And that was all pretty straightforward, and we knew what to offer. And we knew, you know, approximately what our outages would look like. Now we're selling by online pickup and store. Um, we can't think about every night what products are going to be available in the particular store from where the particular visitor to the website is coming to show what products they may be able to purchase to buy online and pick up in the store the next day. So it's sort of forecasting what our inventory will look like at a store by store level, at a visitor by visitor level. Right, I see your, your face, Daniel. That is not an easy math. That is not something that we can do um, you know, in my Excel spreadsheet. Um, and I think that, that type of um, detailed inventory planning, um, we really do need better tools and we need AI. Yeah, I think, you know, Daniel, a lot of, all, all I'd add in the, boring versus effective is I actually think that um, it's not all that boring when you start really digging into the the more kind of uh, you know day-to-day -day use cases because it's it's I wouldn't say it's easy but step one is getting a model that works and that's going to cover some percentage of your member base or some percentage of your SKUs or uh, and then you're going to have that long tail and I think that long tail usually adds up to a very sizable opportunity and i think it gets pretty interesting trying to increase your coverage how quickly can you really personalize for a customer or do they need to have been a member for two and a half years before you have enough data at which point they're relatively loyal already is how much value is there in, uh you know chasing after them so i think it gets pretty innovative when you try and scale it and you can take that crawl walk run approach within the boring and i don't i hate calling it boring but yeah, within it's not boring within within that within that ecosystem as well because just building a model step one building a model that works at scale then building a model that not only covers your entire member base but you're able to effectively do inference in real time at scale in a production environment catch it accurately when the model is starting to drift etc it's just layers of challenges that you keep tacking on to just do machine learning effectively 
in a kind of production environment. So it's it's exciting. It's constantly exciting. Absolutely, I, I totally agree. I think it's it's hard to really really focus on customers at scale and really understand the average what the what the entire customer base is doing um, is extremely extremely difficult. I think it's easier to kind of really focus on maybe like an individual, but with individuals. It's also difficult because you have millions and millions of different individuals that have lots of different types of behavior. So it's really trying to find that middle ground, really trying to like segment your customer population and try to find like groups of groups of customers that have similar types of behavior, which you're trying to model, which you're trying to predict. I think that's where you can start to really leverage um, the technology to be able to make advances. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Al, for jumping in there. So to jump into the next topic, um, and Patrick, I believe, will flash it on the screen. So, uh, you know, it seems like you all agree that there's a lot of different use cases, but when it comes to competitive advantage, you know, in a difficult or intense business environment, uh, it can be, you know, difficult to not want to just be the best at everything. So the question I'd love for all of you to answer is, when is it absolutely critical to try to use AI for operations? And when is it, you know, not critical? Um, and Amin, I was wondering if you maybe could take a stab at this to kick us off here. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that, you know, one of, one of my core beliefs is kind of focusing on building your differentiators and focusing on your differentiators in-house. I think, Daniel, what you're doing with the consortium sounds super exciting because there's so many different pieces of the puzzle to do just data, right? And data at scale that you kind of get bogged down trying to build every piece of that infrastructure and those capabilities yourself. And the way I like to think about it is you're very rarely going to be able to do something better than a company that's dedicating their entire existence to doing that thing. So use them for that thing and build a differentiator because these are probably going to be some of the most expensive resources you have on payroll. So you want to make sure you're uh, deploying them efficiently. Uh, and, and I think you do that with that simple rule of thumb of if somebody's entire existence is building X, just buy it and don't build it yourself <laughs> and, and focus, focus on what you're, what you're doing, you know? Um, and, and that's kind of the rule of thumb we use while deciding where to build it and, and, and focus our, our internal resources. I mean, thank you so much. One clarifying question. So that sounds like a build versus buy question, which I'm really glad you said that. Um, however, to take a step back even further and, and say, well, should I even invest the resources in a particular use case or a particular problem to solve with AI, you know, even what, regardless of whether it's build or buy, is there a yeah. way you think about something like that? Yeah, I think, you know, one thing that uh, and I answered completely the wrong question, Daniel. You very politely told me that you you were super kind in the way you were like, I don't know what you just answered. So I appreciate that. Uh, uh, I asked but... the wrong question to me. That's really what the takeaway. <laughs> uh, so I think that I think I think yeah, we've got we've got you know we've got heuristics all over the place. So I can help I can help answer. I can I can provide our view or my view on that as well. I think it's focusing on respecting your domain experts. I've come from you know. Uh, cancer research to e-commerce focused on shoe sales to now healthcare. And one thing I've learned is we like doubting that data and math is a universal language and it's the same everywhere, but it's really not. I think the domain expertise that uh, people who've done this their entire lives, the pieces they try to augment and support with data and machine learning, they really know where their instincts are right and where their instincts need help. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of found that leaning on the domain experts and focusing on the use cases where they believe automation can help usually gives you a bigger bang for your buck because with machine learning use cases that you dig into, it's almost two-pronged on whether you're going to get an ROI or not. One, are you going to be able to solve the problem, which is already difficult? But two, are you going to get the domain experts to adopt your solution? And adoption is just as much of a battle as actually solving the problem when it comes to seeing a return on an investment in a particular use case. So I would argue that your first kind of filter should be, are your domain experts gonna use what you're building? And if your answer to that is yes, then you can start digging into feasibility and you know the resources it's gonna take. Do you have the data, et cetera? Thank I you so can. much. 
I actually see the first two questions as being very related, the build versus buy and the, you know, what's worth doing question. Um, and I think that the example that jumps out for me is I spent a lot of time in the um, ad tech world and how do we optimize digital advertising? How do we optimize paid search? How do we optimize email and attribution? And attribution is a fabulous multi-touch attribution, fabulous technology, which will never add up to anything else that you're working on. And, and a great example of where you just shouldn't spend your time is um, if you have a tool that's going to help you optimize or an approach that's going to help you optimize a particular marketing channel, it does not have to be the same as the approach that you take for other marketing channels. Use something more global to figure out where to spend the money like MMM, but then use the tool that's going to work in that channel and accept that your numbers are not going to add up to 100, but you're still going to do the best you can to spend the money where it's going to make the most difference. I mean, I think I think the questions are related too, right? In that, obviously, at the Infrastructure Alliance, we spend a lot of time thinking about it. We, Everybody has seen the horrible, what I call the NASCAR slide with the 300 logos that neatly fit into each stupid bucket that the marketer made up. And of course, like it's total nonsense, right? Like most of these platforms overlap in lots of different areas, plus they're gonna expand. So we spend a lot of time thinking about the blueprint of like, you know, what are the top level categories and where are these, you know, these companies starting to, to sort? And we're, our first report on that landscape will be out in the summertime, making sense of a ton of research going into that those different aspects and where it's it's far along, where it's not too far along. That build versus buy, when you're talking about it, all the early companies had to build because nothing existed, but we're getting to the point now where there is more commercial software and, and that's important. I would say the last thing though, we talked about the, you know, the boring or the simple use cases. I think a lot of companies are doing that. I think they have to, but I do think I'm also starting to see what I'm calling AI driven businesses. And those are companies that have an AI uh, model sort of at the core of their business model. So if you think about three types of companies, you think about something like Boeing, they're going to have, you know, AI in five different departments, but their business is making airplanes. You might have an AI driven culture like Stitch Fix, but their business is still shipping clothes in a box, right? But then there's an AI driven business model. I think these are going to be very exciting for retail. The example that I always use is I've seen at least three companies doing photorealistic fashion model uh, generation, right? So if you think about, I've got 5,000 pieces of clothing, I want to show all those different permutations on a human model with different ethnicities, different body shapes, et cetera. It's going to be hugely expensive, but I can do it with AI. And then I can hire a subset of human models to do my hero shoot, spend all the money on that. So that's an AI driven business. I think we're going to see more and more of those over the next five to 10 years. I think not everyone is there yet, but some of those types of things are really exciting to think about in the future. Absolutely. <clears throat> I totally agree. I think there's a lot of companies that are caught up on the idea of optimization and really trying to push um, one of their KPIs from five from 95% to 96% to 96% and just really increase it 1% at a time. When most companies really need to focus on what are these like feasible solutions, they're just really trying to find, you know, they're instead of trying to optimize the Model S Tesla and trying to optimize optimize how far the seat leans back. Um, most companies really need just a, a Model T, you know, a Ford Model T. They just need a car. They just need something that can move. And too many people are really focusing on those, those small percentage lifts. I think there's lots of opportunities for really trying to understand your customers better. I think that's the place where you can probably make the biggest, biggest impact. Um, really trying to understand how customers are perceiving your products, how they're perceiving your store, how they're interacting with your store. Um, really understanding those kind of those kind of things, I think, is is super crucial. Versus, you know, really trying to increase that one percent lift um, from a specific KPI. Definitely. Hey, um, also Blake, just to follow up with you, and and I think the other three panelists really um will be interested in this. I mean, Drinks is a leader in the e-commerce alcohol space. <clears throat> um, and you'll correct me if that's not how you no, phrase absolutely. it. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, drinks seems to ha be one of these businesses that has AI at the center of the business model. I mean, it seems like the way that you are going about doing everything you're doing to some extent is very reliant on AI. So could you say a little more about kind of how AI, uh, you think about AI use cases at drinks and where to spend your time on basically? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what drinks is trying to do is really trying to enable other companies to be able to sell wine online. In addition to that, we're really trying to build in data um, data science and data analytics is really the most expensive tools that your company might might have. Um, the services that you might be able to provide um, at Drinks, we're trying to provide those kind of services and then lend, leverage those to other companies. So, 
we're trying to enable a company like a winery that might only sell one or two wines um, online, or maybe you've never sold a wine online. I mean, you can be able to leverage national trends. We can try to leverage past experiences. We can understand what millions of customers are doing for their small customer base. So really trying to take the experience of others and really trying to pass that forward so that other people can leverage that to improve improve their business. So I think it's really useful to be able to understand things at large scales. And it's really hard to do that if you're a really small company. So we're trying to enable other companies to be able to have that, that ability. Cool. Amazing. Let's jump into the next topic. Patrick, if you wouldn't mind flashing on the screen. Okay, so let's talk about data, something everyone in this panel is very familiar with. Garbage in, garbage out, as the old saying goes. What must every organization do with data in order to successfully use AI, and how must they do it? Melissa, I was curious if you wouldn't mind opening this, because you, uh, as you yourself mentioned, are in the process of moving an organization that's been doing what it's been doing for a while, kind of along. So what do you think about this? Yeah, um, no data is clean, all data is garbage. But I think what I try to focus in on is what is possible with the data that we have today. Um, I, I've worked, and I'm sure you all have too, on companies that were um, extensively focused on cleaning up the data and having clean metadata and knowing where everything is and what everything is and completely consistent definitions across the board. And um, you only get fun to do that for so long uh, before you have to start delivering some, some answers and some insights. And, and right aid, you know, the data could not be messier. We have um, identities at both a household and an individual level that we try to merge in together to get to a customer view. We have um, a huge segment of our data, which is um, pharmacy data. So we have HIPAA regulations, which you know prevent you from using it for anything inappropriate. And yet, if you think about a customer's perspective, I'm not going to go pick up my milk at the Rite Aid if the pharmacist didn't have my prescription ready for me, right? That's the most important thing to a customer. Um, so no, we're not gonna have clean data, but we can do a lot with the data that we have. And I think that um, my approach in building out this team and building out our capabilities is to look for projects, technologies, approaches that we can take now with the messy data while we move towards a cleaner uh, model, which will never be clean. I totally, totally agree. I think probably five years ago, I would have said it was more important to have lots of data to be able to drink from that fire hose and be able to absorb as much data as physically possible. But I totally agree that I think right now it's all about small data, clean data, having the most accurate data that you can possibly have is actually more important than just having a lot of it, um, especially in like the medical field when you have people that have really rare diseases. Um, I'd hate to see you have to like wait long enough to have hundreds of thousands of people get a disease <clears throat> before you can actually act on it versus having small data where it's really clean and be able to interpret it, we can act really quickly. I think that's actually more important. I think that's actually the future of where data should go is really trying to figure out how do we make this clean? How do we make this more usable versus getting more and more of it? Because in some places you just can't, you just can't get that or you don't want to get that much more data. Because more people would get sick in your example. Absolutely. I mean, I think there's, there's there's a couple deltas, right? I mean, first, I want to thank Andrew for writing Pachyderm's marketing for for us in terms of data centric. But I think that the there is a concept of like you either work on it from an algorithm level or you work on it from the, the data level. I think probably you end up doing both. I think most of the history up until this point has been on experiment tracking and you know working with the algorithm. And if you had problems with the data, you overcome it with the algorithm. And I think that's shifting a bit, especially. Um, with the understanding that not everyone's going to have a, a massive data set and that um, oftentimes you could, the model is a solved problem for a lot of the problems that you're working on. And if you you put in, you know, five different uh, versions of an algorithm, it's not going to come out with a better percentage. But if you realize that your labelers were totally inconsistent and you go back and, and don't say, well, it's those idiots, but you know, you you realize, you know, I'm the idiot, and I should have given them better instructions, and I'm going to refine the heuristic. You know, that's really important. Or if you look at the retail use cases or medic, medical, you know, I'm starting to see a lot of the synthetic data companies 
use that as like a baseline in order to generate synthetic data, which you can train on, uh, you know, those kinds of things. So there's a lot of value. It's just a different mindset to work on it from the data side. You need to have sort of creative thinking. You need to have some old school engineering, you know, skills. If you're, if you're trying to get a model that, you know, is able to pick out commands in a car and you find that it's terrible with 10% of them with background noise, you could go engineer the algorithm, engineer the model, or you could go generate synthetic versions of that by grabbing a bunch of background noise and kids screaming at each other and, and music or whatever and synthetically add to the samples that you already have in order to create that background noise, right? But that's a different mindset. That's an audio engineering, traditional coding, right? And so there's there's gonna be more of an interdisciplinary team, I think, as, as AI develops more and more. And, and, and depending on which side of the equation you work on, um, it, it's going to require a different mindset in terms of how to really develop these things to the next level. I think it really comes down to what level of the organization you're, you're looking at. I think your machine learning, your data science team should be basically tasked with doing the best it can with what's available, but then if you, if you if you if you click out a level you you know to your point Blake we want to we want to make small volumes of data highly efficient and i think to make small volumes of data highly efficient it needs to be well governed and uh, understood so that you can extract as much signal from it as as possible i think one of the concepts that we've employed at orange theory is this idea of certifying a data set with a with general understanding of what the data that's available is available, but when a, when a, when a data set is certified, uh, it can be held to a certain standard, it can be held to a certain level of accountability. Uh, you can be assured that there's certain contracts in place. And I think that's just a function of the, the data engineering world kind of catching up with the contract-based discipline of the more like traditional software engineering world. And I think it's a, it's slow progress, but we're, we're, we're getting there. Uh, and you know, I think that there's two layers to it. One is the kind of feature engineering and data-centric AI approach of engineering your data for the purpose of building an AI style algorithm versus you know, data governance extends past that security, privacy, just general com regulatory compliance on how you report out on how a business is doing, et cetera. And I think you you need a certain shared language there because you know, we go back to adoption, you go back to respecting your domain experts. I believe the currency of a good, strong analytics organization is trust more than it's the data. And no one really knows the thousand things you did to keep the data as close to accurate as possible, but they sure as hell remember that one KPI that changed by 5% last quarter. And I think that erosion of trust is, is an expensive one for an analytics team. So it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act. It's a bit of a tightrope. So it's like focus on your data governance while empowering your data science team to extract as much value as fast as they can from whatever is available to them. Excellent. To jump into the next question, uh, and Daniel, I was curious if we could uh, have you begin this one because you know, you've worked with a bunch of different partners. Um, if there was such a thing as low hanging fruit when it came to AI use cases in retail, what would you say it is? I know we touched on sometimes simple is better, but not always. Um, is there any way you typically steer, you know, a potential new partner, you know, in a situation where they're just getting going? What are your thoughts on this? I mean, a lot of the times it's, it, it's going to depend on what you want to achieve, right? I mean, there's, there's low hanging fruit if you have a really advanced team and you could address, you know, things with computer vision if you wanted to, to look at, um, if you wanted to look at inventory, for instance, right, you could do those, you know, there are a number of companies that are out there now looking at just put, have cameras pointing at all the shelves and figuring out what's missing, right, and, and then doing estimates on that. So something like that can be, you know, fantastic. Um, but I would always argue for simpler is better, especially if the team's just starting um, in, into midsize. And those tends, tend to be kind of uh, the structured data types of things, right? It's sort of like, uh, you know, the churn prediction, demand forecasting, you know, um, inventory projection ordering. I mean, if you look at something like Otto uh, out of Germany, I mean, they had their big claim to fame in the retail side was being able to just have, you know, their machine learning models do 90% of the ordering, you know, better than, than humans could by looking at 
a million different variables, right? And if you had a gigantic team of people, you could do those types of things. I, I think it has to be a combination of blowing fruit though, and understanding what's gonna potentially have some of the biggest impact. And you should start by looking at the places that could not be solved with traditional coding. If you think about Elon Musk basically says, don't use machine learning as a first choice. Uh, but then, you know, the first thing is, can you do it with traditional code? But when you're outside of traditional code, then you start looking at machine learning to augment all of those gaps. And those gaps are quite huge. And that's where you start to get exciting results, right? So you, you have to combo it with simplicity and with where is it going to make the most the most impact. And I think, you know, as, as, as Blake was saying, sometimes if you get kind of a, you know, a low level group, they might just be saying, look, let's just go optimize this KPI or get us up 1% or, or do something really not innovative or interesting whatsoever uh, versus a group that's holistically looking at where are our bottlenecks, where are things going really slowly and how could we potentially speed those up with, with machine learning? I think that's the first thing any company has to do to be really good at this. I think on top of that, um, probably one of the first steps is really trying to understand the data that you have. I think there's a lot of companies out there that have a lot of data that just don't realize how much they have and what they have and what they can possibly learn from it. So I think a lot of people are sitting on some really interesting data that they can probably do a lot of really cool stuff with, and they just don't know it because they just haven't taken stock of it um, from, well, we have tons of customer data, but there's way too much of it, or you know, we can't undo anything with it because there's millions and millions of customers if you can start to segment that customer population and break it down and really understand how groups of customers are behaving, also that opens a, brand, a bunch of brand new doors of what you can kind of go after that wasn't possible before, but it all starts off with just really understanding what data do I have? What, what, do, we, what do we actually have? What can we, what can we interpret from what we, what we currently are getting? One of the kind of, um, and, I, and I think I, I really, I love both those, uh, both those answers because I think it, it, it it talks about how you're constantly balancing with these resources that are extremely coveted resources that are constantly interviewing at every other uh, company that's within a five mile radius. And there's, you know, it's funny, but you gotta like kind of prioritize the work to keep your data scientists happy to some extent as well, or they're gonna be off uh, doing it elsewhere. But uh, one of the, one of the uh, rules of thumb that we've, I've kind of liked falling back on in various different industries is finding the kind of redundant work, the place like opportunities for automation, where you see experts doing the same thing over and over again, and it's just time consuming. It's not exciting to them. It's time consuming in a bottleneck and whatever the product is. And it's usually a fun opportunity to deploy a machine learning solution, but you know, keeping Daniel's uh, point, in mind is first see if you can solve it with just a traditional automation, then see if machine learning is an opportunity. And it's usually a fun solve. It allows you to kind of flex your muscles and build up your infrastructure a little bit, but at the same time, pull in that investment into what's likely a new organization by solving these uh, pain points that have probably been there for years early. And then there's that kind of illusion of magic that you know people like to pour dollars into. And then you can focus on the more exciting stuff. Uh, it almost sounds a little sneaky, but I feel like getting investment for data teams has been a little sneaky because just because the expectations very rarely realistically align with the ease with which it is, you know, the ease of delivering a viable solution at scale. So if we talk about low-hanging fruit that would change the industry. I want to go with a means focus on staffing. And, you know, this is a fabulous field. This is a fabulous field where you can make money and make a difference and, and have fun and do, you know, great puzzles every day. And we need so many more of us. Somebody should do a really good job of churning out the next many generations, and maybe they're my age, but the next many thousands of data analysts um, to help us all move our industry forward. Sounds like we have a bit of a call to action to the audience there. <laughs> um, yeah, very, very cool. Thank you so much for, for um, mentioning all that. 
One thing I did want to comment on, so Amin, you made this really interesting comment earlier about product different differentiators and um, how focusing on yeah, where the maximum value is to make your customers say, wow, Orange Theory is special for X reason. Maybe they don't even know what's going on in the background, but wherever you can add just a ton of value, that's really important to invest a ton of your effort. And right now you're in the midst of really doing some interesting work in, in an area that is very unique to Orange Theory. I was wondering if you could say more about just how you think about maximizing the value of Orange Theory Fitness's sort of retail value to the world, um, you know, with all the health data and what you can share about how you approach that. Uh, so, you know, Orange Theory is, is extremely cool in the sense that there's hundreds of thousands of people doing the same workout on any given day. So that's just to anybody that's data oriented over there that immediately, you know, you book your years up because you've got a very controlled ecosystem of data being generated across a, you know, various cities, various age groups, various fitness levels, et cetera. But the, 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 it's controlled for the same uh, workout on, on any given day. So what I believe is that we have a kind of unique opportunity to learn from that data and learn from how our member base is reacting to a particular template and then help coach them into continuing to drive adherence. One of the reasons that we think Orange Theory is as successful as it is, is that it, it genuinely works. And I think that beyond the product, beyond the data, the, the idea that we're able to generate uh, this habit forming behavior where people keep going back and working out and continuing to see those gains over years is, is something that we kind of we prescribe to this philosophy of creating more life, more life not being longevity or living forever, more life just being being the ability to do more after a long day, being able to go out, out, hit a park up, go to a movie, go on a hike, whatever, just live more. And that's an exciting call to action that we all are pretty you know, privileged to be able to focus on every day. And I think using that data to not try and get you to keep going, but get you to go in a safe manner, know when it's time to recover, know when it's time to push a little bit harder to maintain that level of adherence is, is pretty exciting. And, uh, and, you know, I'm giving a relatively vague answer because there's a lot of exciting stuff to come and uh, we're not quite <laughs> ready to talk about it as yet, but we're going to see some pretty big releases in the next, uh, in the next uh, three to six months, which I think is going to not only be a differentiator, but be a powerful driver in, uh, for the experience as well. And, 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 and pretty excited for our members. Yeah, thank you so much. And then just to provide just an additional example, um, Blake, question is going to be directed at you. So, you know, Drinks is a relatively new organization, right? And I have to imagine the only reason you would be incorporating so much AI in the product at a fairly early stage is that mm -hmm. it is in some way differentiating the service and products that you can provide. And so to offer another example of this sort of, you know, idea to the audience, what would you say about how AI differentiates Drinks? So I think one thing that Drinks is doing <clears throat> that nobody else is really doing right now. <clears throat> one thing that Drinks is doing that nobody else is really doing right now is really trying to understand how customers are perceiving products. Um, there's so many places and so many opportunities where customers are being given an image to try to represent an experience. You can think of like uh, Netflix movie posters trying to represent the experience you're going to have for watching a movie <clears throat> or a music album cover is trying to represent the experience that you're going to have listening to the, listening to the to the to the music. Um, you can imagine a Taylor Swift album cover versus a ACDC album cover. The cover itself is giving you a whole insight into what that experience is going to be. And with wine, the label itself is trying to explain or trying to give you convey what the experience will be for consuming that wine. When you're trying to buy it online, you, you can't ask an expert, you can't taste the wine, you can't experience the wine in any other way besides just looking at this bottle and saying, oh, here's a little description of what, what, what the wine is, um, but you really don't have a way to kind of attach those. And I think a lot of companies have this, this problem of, they don't know how that, that label is being perceived, how that branding is being perceived and trying to unlock that is what we're trying to do at Drinks, which is to me revolutionary to be able to really understand how customers are buying their products online. How are they you know, interacting with these brands, with these labels, with these products, with these boxes um, is I think it's universal that a lot of people need or have the opportunity to take advantage of 
understanding this perception that if I design my label with this, I might be able to put a customer in this kind of mindset where they feel more romantic, or maybe they feel um, more cheerful, or they maybe they feel um, you know more serious or whatever of the various kinds of feelings you might have. You can be able to convey those by the kind of products that you're trying to show them and the the, the options that you're putting on that on that product. Excellent. Thank you so much for that insight. And then I, I, Melissa, I just have to ask you a similar question. So, I mean, so for, you know, a retail company that's been around, you know, a little bit longer, I mean, is there an avenue for differentiation via AI or is it more of a situation where it's about, you know, just cutting costs, improving operations where it can be, but, you know, maybe less of an opportunity for differentiation? What would you say? I mean, what do you think? So I think, and I don't want to build it myself, but I think if one of you all wanted to provide a really fabulous chat bot that could do us, help us do a better job of helping our customers nights and weekends, um, there is a huge need. And this is not just at Rite Aid. I saw this at Comcast and Vanguard as well. Um, there is a huge need to help less technical customers navigate this new world, you know, help my mother um, when she tries to go figure out how to log on to use her loyalty points. Um, and I think that, you know, chatbots start to do that, but we just have to get much smarter and much deeper in the answers that we give and understanding the one-off questions that people are going to have. And really, if you can help my mother log on, I'd be really grateful. If you if you can help people log on and that's your business model, you'll be a, a trillionaire. <clears throat> to, you know, you could sell that to every company on earth. Right? That I, as a former IT consultant uh, who yeah. who had an IT company, I can tell you that that was ninety percent of my job. As well. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, all right, so we have time for one last question here, and. Uh, Melissa, you talked about the future a little bit uh, earlier. So um, I know you literally just gave your answer, but I am curious, you know, all of you are focusing on AI. You're all focusing on that in different ways. Where do we hope th to see the retail industry go over the next five or 10 years when it comes to AI? Melissa, you want to expand upon your chat on answer and just holistically offer a thought here? Yeah, actually, I'll give you the second answer, though. I mean, I, we do need better chat bots, but what I hope for Rite Aid and what I hope that I'm driving in my role is that... Um, we have the data infrastructure, the AI infrastructure to see our customers holistically across all of their touch points, whether that be the pharmacy, the front end or the website or our loyalty program, and that we make decisions about our customers with that full customer lifetime focus view. Um, I think that all of our um, retailers, especially our in-store retailers tend to be short-sighted and, you know, the drive is always to get that next dollar sale at the store. Um, I think that AI gives us a way to think about um, the, the future customer experience that's, that's a little less um, short-sighted um, and more holistic. And that's where I hope we go. I hope at one point we can start to leverage the advantages of e-commerce. Um, being able to remove those kind of physical constraints is super, super empowering. Um, I've often, there's the online version of a store and the brick and mortar version of a store. They try to be as close as, as possible, but there's no reason why it has to be that way. You can make a store that's unique to every customer that walks in, in a digital environment, but you can't do it into a physical environment. So it's like, we should be able to take advantage of that. Um, I'm always thinking about this, like, hypothetical, um, you know, silent recommender, silent expert that comes with you everywhere you shop. Um, imagine <laughs> if you go to a, um, if you go to a wine store and you had a wine expert that was walking with you and knew exactly which, um, which foods you're going to make, which wines you like, which tasting notes you like, which kind of experience you have, what your budget's looking like. If you, they knew that when you came in, they could show you exactly which wine you want to purchase. Or if you went to a home improvement store, and it, you had your contractor that was in charge of electrical or versus the contractor in charge of plumbing or with gardening or all the different sections that had those kind of expertise and knew what projects you're working on, knew what your budget was, knew what your other tools were. They had those kind of other pieces. That's possible in the digital world, but it's impossible in the physical world. And so we could really should be taking advantage of that. I'd love to be able to see that in the future where you could have this kind of expert that comes with you no matter where you go that just has, just kind of finds what you're looking for 
faster and get you what you need faster versus you trying to learn a new brand new system in every store you go to. When you go from one store to another, all of a sudden you have to learn a brand new system. How do I search for what I'm looking for? Which words do I need to use? What filtering do I need to apply? You know, how do I find those specific products? But if I have that expert with me, they could actually show me what those products are. And I think we need to lean that direction in the future. I mean, Daniel, want to jump in here as well? Yeah, I would. I, I agree with both those answers. I think it's just, uh, it's about machine learning, data-driven, AI-driven solutions just becoming more ubiquitous and more easily accessible so that, uh, and I've seen this over the last, you know, the the five, six years I spent in e-commerce and the, the time since then, I've seen it become more prevalent. I've seen, uh, you know, that idea of hearing a company's name and being like, well, they probably don't have a very AI-driven search algorithm. It's, it's kind of moving further and further away. It's it's more ubiquitous. It's more democratized. It's more accessible. And I think that's thanks to you know, Daniel, a lot of the tooling that's available, a lot of the tooling that kind of abstracts out this mm -hmm. massive engineering team that you would need to even get started. So I think what I'd like to see personally in the next five to 10 years is more of that, just more ease of accessibility, more of, you know, uh, standardization and democratization of these various tools that make it cheaper to use your data more efficiently, to make your experience more frictionless and help Melissa's mom just, you know, shop easier and, you know, uh, and get support and uh, personalization. And, you know, I love that point you made, Blake, where each experience can be a boutique experience, not just to you, but to what you're looking for in that moment. And it, it, it's something you can never achieve in a, in a brick and mortar experience. So it's just unlocking capabilities so we can just see people go wild and get completely innovative with what they think that ideal digital experience looks like. I mean, I'll put on my futurist hat to, to end it off, I guess here, right? I mean, just even beyond sort of retail, there's not a single industry on earth that's not gonna benefit from being smarter, right? There's not gonna be any industry on earth that's not touched by AI. I've had a habit in my life of like pivoting into, um, you know, technologies before they, you know, become kind of mainstream. Um, so this is sort of my fourth revolution, if you will. Um, I remember you know, getting into Linux in the early days and my recruiters were saying that, you know, that's stupid, all the jobs are in Solaris. And I said, Solaris won't exist in 10 years. And they looked at me like I had two heads. Um, you know, I went to work in the internet uh, when that was a really dumb idea. Like when most people thought like, why would you have a website? And they would have a debate about whether a company should have a website online and my parents couldn't understand what the hell I was doing with my life. So I would say when it comes to AI, it's really the last technology I'll ever have to be in. And, and that's because again, there's nothing in, in 20 years, um, the biggest companies in the world will be artificial intelligence companies um, specifically. Uh, not all of them, of course, you're still gonna have energy and you're still gonna have technology and those sorts of things. Um, but really it's going to touch every single industry on earth. I would love to see the, the expert level systems um, that you know everybody wants our little AI friend. Um, and to, to do that, we have to jump into sort of multimodal AI and you're starting to see um, you know groups do that. Uh, uh, the research teams kind of do those kinds of things. But even in the short term, there's going to be, I think major differentiators, especially across retail and everything else, where the companies that embrace it now and build their teams in that pro run and start to find more creative ways to use it and then start to find more absolute business use cases and sort of things that drive, that couldn't exist without artificial intelligence. You look at something like Dolly 2 and people go, oh, that's really cute. What are you talking about? That's the thing I can describe that, just, that, that creates an image and then I can highlight a middle and say, replace the cat with a dog and it does that. And then if I'm a master, Photoshop programmer, I could go in and just edit and do a couple of tweaks. That's revolutionary, right? And there's gonna be a number of revolutionary types of things like that across the board. So if you don't have the team and you're not ready for it, um, you're gonna be out of business. It's as simple as that. Excellent. Well, uh, it was a pleasure talking to all of you. I think we're about out of time. So Patrika, if you are still here, I will turn it back over to you. Wow, what a great session. Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed it. Please make your way to your next session. Also, don't forget to check out the networking, accept your connection request, and explore the AI exhibits. Have a great time.